Hi everyone, it's Misha. I'm making a movie today because I want to tell you a story. But first, I want to show you something I got. My local library was having a magazine giveaway, and so I got so many magazines. <laughs> I, I tried to pick up a stack of science, and it's a big stack, it's very heavy, and I got to the door, and they said, no. If you're going to take that magazine, you have to take all of them. And so I picked up another stack, and there was even another stack that was about twice this size. But someone else wanted it, so I was happy to give it to her. Uh, I didn't realize that Science was a weekly magazine, and they have to give them away by the year, some, for some reason. <laughs> anyway, I have a lot of magazines now. I'm really excited to use them for, uh, probably, uh, I'll read them, but, or most of them, but I will also use them for art projects. Oh, um, but, the story I wanted to tell you, I, I got science and I got astronomy. And then I saw this stack of magazines that I've never heard of before, called Muse. And it says it's the magazine of life, the universe, and pie throwing. And I didn't know what that meant, and I was just so curious that I had to, I had to get it. But it, there weren't very many in the year. It doesn't even come out once a month. In any case, I, I started flipping through the magazine, and I saw that there was a story that interested me, and I thought I would read it to you guys, because you might find it interesting as well. The story is called Ghosts and Gumshoes by Doug Stewart, the strange case of the skeptical magician and the gullible detective writer. Harry Houdini and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle both loved to test the boundary between the impossible and the improbable. You might say their friendship, based on magic tricks and messages from the dead, was doomed from the start. New Friends Early in 1920, the celebrated American magician Harry Houdini was on tour in England. He was an expert at card tricks and pulling live rabbits out of hats, but his on-stage specialty was freeing himself from sealed boxes in which he had been placed, bound and handcuffed, a few minutes before. No one could figure out how Houdini managed his escapes. To many people, it seemed that he had mastered the art of dematerialization disappearing from one spot and reappearing somewhere else, like Harry Potter and his friends disapparating. Houdini seemed for all the world to be a real-life wizard. One of the English celebrities who came to see the mystifying American perform that year was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the mystery writer. Conan Doyle was as famous around the world as Houdini was, thanks to his wildly popular detective stories, starring crime solver Sherlock Holmes. Sir Arthur's admirers may have assumed that he, like the brainy sleuth he had created, was committed to keen observation, hard evidence, and logical reasoning. If so, they were wrong. Conan Doyle believed in fairies, ghosts, haunted houses, and messages from beyond the grave. He rushed backstage after one of Houdini's performances, and the pair talked well into the night. 
Sir Arthur believed that certain people, called mediums, had supernatural psychic abilities. He was convinced that Houdini was one of them. The magician, for his part, never pretended to have special powers. When asked, he liked to say that his act relied on skill, strength, patience, and the ability to maneuver his body in tight spaces. Often, as part of his act, he'd demonstrate how people who called themselves mediums were just doing ordinary magic tricks. But Houdini didn't want to contradict his new friend. As a performer, he knew that having a fan as important as Arthur, Conan Doyle, a man knighted by the Queen, no less, was good for ticket sales. The friendship of Arthur Conan Doyle and Harry Houdini was certainly one of the strangest in entertainment history. One was a gullible detective writer, the other a suspicious magician. You didn't need to be a fortune teller to predict that their friendship wouldn't last. When their falling out came, it was painful, bitter, and very public. Arthur Conan Doyle was a huge, barrel-chested man with a handlebar mustache, a booming voice, and a fondness for boxing and adult-sized tricycles. You can see what he looks like. Like Dr. Watson, Sherlock Holmes' fictional sidekick, Conan Doyle was trained as a medical doctor. He had quit medicine as a young man to write stories full-time. By the time he met Harry Houdini, he was 60 and bored with crime fiction. What obsessed Conan Doyle now was spiritualism. This was the idea that the spirits of people who had died could communicate with us from the afterlife, from the afterworld. Millions of people in those days, even including a few scientists and politicians, shared Sir Arthur's fascination with otherworldly messages. That might sound silly now, but how many of us today believe in mind reading, the Loch Ness Monster, or UFOs? Spiritualists flocked to small private gatherings called seances. There, after the lights went out, mediums would thrill their paying customers by summoning the spirits of departed loved ones. The spirits would announce their arrival with knocks on a tabletop, perhaps, or a glow-in-the-dark handkerchief flying through the air. Deciding exactly what the signals meant was the medium's job. In 1920, it was easy for people to believe that the world was filled with mysterious, invisible forces, new scientific discoveries, electrical power, radio waves, x-rays, radioactivity, or as baffling as magic. Since most people believed, and still do, in some kind of afterlife, was it so strange to think that the communication between this life and the next might be possible? <clears throat> the huge death toll of the Great War, now known as World War I, also spurred interest in psychics and the supernatural. Around 8.5 million people had been killed in the fighting. Those who had lost friends and relatives dreaded to think that death was final. Conan Doyle had lost someone, too. His eldest son, Kingsley, was a British Army officer who died of pneumonia while recovering from war wounds in 1918. At a seance soon afterward, Conan Doyle heard Kingsley say he was happy and felt his son's reassuring hand on his shoulder. He couldn't actually see anything in the dark. Nevertheless, after this, Sir Arthur's faith in the spirit world began, became unshakable. Newspapers poked fun at him. Many of his old readers were either puzzled or amused that their favorite detective writer now believed in talking ghosts. To skeptics, Sir Arthur's retort was, If that wasn't my son's hand on my shoulder, then whose was it? This was not the kind of reasoning that Sherlock Holmes would have used. As the detective liked to say to the ever-baffled Dr. Watson, When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Conan Doyle, however, was too quick to rule things out as impossible. For example, that Houdini could simply wriggle out of handcuffs, or that a nice-seeming medium might play a trick in the dark, and too eager to choose a supernatural explanation instead. <clears throat> the Skeptic 
Harry Houdini, compact and intense with a penetrating gaze and an acrobat's grace, was a natural showman. Let's get a look at him now. I believe it. He looks pretty intense. He was born Eric Weiss in Hungary in 1874 to a rabbi and his wife. By age nine, having moved to Wisconsin with his family, he was working as a trapeze artist. As a teenager, he worked side shows in amusement halls doing magic tricks. Later, he and his wife, Bess, performed as mind readers. He changed his name to Harry Houdini in honor of French ma magician Jean-Robert Houdini and began specializing in escapes, the more dangerous the better. One act that thrilled and horrified his audiences was his escape from what he called the Chinese water torture cell. After being tightly bound, Houdini was locked inside a metal crate full of water. To avoid drowning, he had to pick the locks while holding his breath. Understandably, Conan Doyle was not the only one who thought this was impossible. What Conan Doyle failed to notice was how much Houdini had in common with Sherlock Holmes. Both the real-life ma magician and the fictional detective were smart, curious, observant, and determined. Sherlock Holmes taught himself to recognize 140 kinds of tobacco ash, the better to analyze crime scenes. Likewise, Houdini once apprenticed himself to a German locksmith for two months, just so he could pick locks more easily. Like Holmes, Houdini would have made a spectacular criminal. <laughs> Sir Arthur and his wife, Jean, visited the Houdinis in New York in 1922. The Conan Doyles were there to spread the word about spiritualism. Sir Arthur spoke to an overflow crowd at Carnegie Hall, including many who had lost family members in the war. He described his conversations with his dead son and other relatives and showed slides of apparitions seen at various seances. People in the crowd called out the names of dead relatives, hoping for news. Houdini, who lived in New York, met Conan Doyle when he arrived, and the two couples resumed their friendship. The two men argued politely about spiritualism. The Englishman knew that his American friend often debunked fake mediums as part of his stage act, Houdini liked to attend seances in disguise, then turn on a flashlight to catch the medium doing something sneaky, like ringing a bell with her toes. Houdini tried not to offend Conan Doyle. He, he described himself as sincerely looking for secrets of the hereafter. It was true. Houdini didn't think messages from spirits were impossible. For years, he had awaited signals from family members who had died, especially his mother. But unlike Conan Doyle, he was a natural skeptic. Gladly would I embrace spiritualism if I could prove its claims, Houdini wrote, but I am not willing to be deluded by the fraudulent impositions of so-called psychics. I like this guy. He seems cool. <laughs> In June 1922, eager to win Houdini over once and for all, Sir Arthur and his wife invited Harry and Bess Houdini for a stay at their seaside hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Conan Doyle would splash about noisily in the hotel pool while Houdini, characteristically, would float face down for minutes at a time. Afterward, the men would talk for hours, mostly about spiritualism. That Sunday, the Conan Doyles invited Houdini to their hotel space for a special seance. Lady Doyle believed she had a gift for automatic writing, copying down messages from spirits while in a trance. She offered to contact Houdini's mother, who had died nine years earlier. Houdini was eager to have her try. In the darkened hotel room, with the curtains closed, the magician sat across from Lady Doyle and her husband. With a beating heart I waited, Houdini later wrote, hoping that I might feel once more the presence of my beloved mother. Conan Doyle said a prayer, then his wife closed her eyes and began breathing deeply. 
Almost immediately, she picked up a pencil and started writing without pause. As the pages filled, her husband passed them across the table to the nervous magician. I want to talk to my boy, my own beloved boy, the message began. There is so much I want to say to him, but I am almost overwhelmed by this joy of talking to him once more. When the seance ended, Conan Doyle seemed triumphant, his wife exhausted. Houdini was exhausted too, but he was also trembling and upset. He knew something that Conan Doyle didn't. His mother could barely read or write English. She had always spoken German to her son. Worse, Lady Doyle's hand, supposedly guided by his mother's spirit, had drawn a Christian cross on the first page, but Houdini's mother had been devoutly Jewish. Houdini had always liked Lady Doyle and her husband, but now he wondered if they were so eager to convert him to spiritualism that they had played a tasteless trick on him. A few months later, he issued a public statement criticizing what happened. Sir Arthur, thick-skinned as ever, blamed Houdini's com cl complaints on rattled nerves after hearing from his late mother. <laughs> the friendship never recovered. On stage, Houdini called his former friend a bit senile for believing the things he did. In a letter to Houdini, Conan Doyle replied, As long as you attack what I know from experience to be true, I have no alternative but to attack you in return. After that, the two stopped exchanging letters and wrote cruel things about each other in newspaper columns instead. Don't do that, you guys. Houdini died unexpectedly in 1926, on Halloween, fittingly enough, after his appendix ruptured. Conan Doyle never stopped believing that Houdini had supernatural powers. In fact, he suspected that the mute magician... used them to make other psychics fail. Just in case, Houdini had made a deal with his wife, Bess, shortly before his death. Whoever died first should try once a year to send a coded message from the afterworld. Each Halloween, for ten years, Bess held a seance in her home, but she never received a message from Harry. After that, she stopped. Ten years is long enough to wait for any man, she explained with admirable common sense. This is a cool poster. Do spirits return? Houdini says no, and proves it. Three shows in one. Magic illusions escapes. Fraud mediums exposed. Lyceum Theater, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, September 2, 3, and 4. Matinee on Saturday. Yeah, I think I, I think I would have gotten along with Houdini. He was a little bit of a firecracker, sounds like. Rebellious. I like that. Throughout the story, there's these little comic book characters, and they come from the front of the magazine. Cocopelli and Company is the name of the comic, and Cocopelli is a character. He's just a black shape. And then this other character is Mimi. I don't know who that is, but they have dialogue here. Mimi says, an author can be very different from his characters. Cocopelli says, true. How many cartoonists have you seen throwing pies? I think they're talking about... I think that's a meta joke. Uh, someone... This is not Mamie, I don't know who this character is. It says, Wow, looks like you're writing a book. What's it called? Coco Pelli says, Seances for Dummies. Copelli meets a ghost. He says, whoa, are you real? The ghost says, I don't know. Are you? Uh, 
of the character, I don't know, says, Why do people try so hard to invite some spirits and to avoid other ones that come uninvited? I'm not sure what he means by that. Anyway, interesting story, interesting magazine. If I find some other interesting stories, I think I'll share those with you guys too.